Okay, we're back here live in Silicon Valley in San Jose for the Open Compute Summit. This is Silicon Angle and Wikibon's The Cube, our flagship program. We go out to the advanced extract the ceiling from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon Angle, and my co host Dave Vellante, co founder of Wikibon.org. And our next guest, JR Rivers, the CEO of Cumulus Networks. Welcome back to The Cube, Cube alumni on at VMworld this past year. Welcome back. Thanks, thanks for having me. So, what's new in uh, your world? Obviously, VMworld uh, was just almost half a year ago, and. Uh, Lots changed <laughs> in this uh, tech world. We're in a bubble. Uh, I think an innovation bubble, personally, I love, but I love bubbles. I think innovation comes out of it. Um, any update on traction? You got some news you want to share with us? Give us a quick update and then let's jump into the news. Yeah, so uh, the, you know, business is moving along, like in the context of, of, of any startup. We've got a lot of customer interest, customer engagements, you know, up and down the spectrum from production to trials, you know, all the way down to proof of concepts. You know, kind of the classic, this is how you go to, go to market. Um, the, the real interesting evo evolution or, or change in the industry is, uh, we just announced today that Dell has, uh, or in conjunction with Dell, they've opened up their networking hardware platforms for third party operating systems, and, and Cumulus Linux is the thir first third party operating system for Dell networking. And you know, we, Dell, and the customers Look at this as kind of a, a pivotal point in networking, uh, especially around the enterprise. In, you know, in the past, uh, if a customer bought a, a platform from you know a, a, an incumbent vendor, they're stuck. You know, once it was wired and cable, that's that's all she wrote. Um, now with Dell, they can buy a Dell networking platform and pick the software that runs on it. Um, they can wire the platform up, and they can you know, put any software that they want on the platform and, and move forward, so it's pretty awesome. So take us through what's the evolution of Linux for networks. Obviously you guys have had a little, little angle on that. And why is it such a big deal for Dell? Obviously Dell is one of the incumbents that Dave was on stage talking about today around the quote proprietary, as Frank called it, proprietary bullshit. Still billions and 400 billion dollar market. Um, Dell's going to, you know, obviously went private. Uh, we spoke to Michael Dell about that privately and he said, hey, I can innovate. So is this their version of separating out and trying to get a network OS to get into this new um, build your own cloud game or is it just fundamentally a product hole fill for them? What's your take on it? What's your view? Well, I, I think it's, it's Dell trying to step them and say, hey, we're not about the proprietary bullshit. So if you look at Dell on the server and storage side, you can buy a Dell server, you can you know, drop down you know, and pick any operating system you want. Yeah, yeah, you bought the hardware from them, but it's industry standard hardware, x86, you know, ARM's coming on for them. Same thing's true on the storage side. You can buy storage solutions from Dell, you, which includes software, or you can buy storage you know, hardware from Dell and put your own software on it, or you know, various software uh, angles on it. Uh, on the networking side with Dell, it's, in the past it's been proprietary bullshit, right? Their own yeah. OS and that's what you're stuck with. And Michael and team looked at it and said, hey, right now we make people like our software to buy our hardware, why are we doing that? We should just open this thing up and people can choose our hardware and then pick the software that makes sense to them. Maybe they'll pick Dell OS, which they got from Force 10. Maybe they'll pick Cumulus. There's going to be other people on that list too. So I'm sure Marius Haas was involved in this deal. He was. And you know, Marius is 3Com, sold that to HP. So Dave, this is, this is an interesting chess game, interesting battlefield kind of lines being formed, you know, converge infrastructure, how that's morphing, what we talked about this morning around this, the Disaggregation. Yeah. So Jerry, I'm interested, um, how do you compare to say the typical white box, right? How do you differentiate from what's going on there? It's got software, management, so define white box. I mean, that's a, that's a tough question, right? In, in, in the context of, of networking, there's uh, kind of, we'll call them little known name brands with their own little so, you know, pieces of software on it that come from various places. Um, we separate that from something we call bare metal networking, and that's really what Dell's kind of stepped up to. We're going to sell you a bare metal piece of network, just like you can buy a bare metal server, and put whatever software you want on it. And then it changes the discussion, so you can have a, a differentiation around what the hardware is. You know, is it you know, quality, which chip it is, is it Broadcom or Intel or that kind of thing. And then you can also have differentiation around the software. What does the software do? What are its characteristics? Is it an open flow software solution? Is it traditional? You know, everybody gets to play separately. So you see differentiation around both layers. A lot of people say, ah, oh, hardware is non-differentiable. We've heard that a lot. <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter. You would disagree with that? Absolutely, I mean, I think if you paid it, you know, Frank's keynote today was a, a leading indication of that. You can, 
you can take an x86 you know, CPU chip you know, from Intel, let's pick them for the sake of argument, and package it up you know, thousands of different ways. And that's part of what OCP is all about, is you know, if I need you know, a dual socket x86 server and I need it sideways or diagonal in, in this big of a space, I can go to a set of providers that can you know, get it to me without having to go through a traditional OEM channel, right? <clears throat> and so that is hardware differentiation. So give us an update on, um, so Dell obviously a huge deal, a giant distribution channel. Where else are you seeing momentum in the marketplace? So we have some, you know, some reasonably large, actually some extremely large outlier customers that we are either in production with or working with on, on heading towards production. Um, we're seeing a, a lot of traction in the, the smaller web presences, uh, you know, content delivery networks, uh, small social media companies, that sort of stuff, private hosting environments. Uh, and those are kind of production engagements. We're seeing uh, a, a lot of trials and proof of concepts in, in enterprises, you know, pharmaceuticals, financials, that sort of thing. Um, for a lot of those guys, the, you know, the procurement channel actually still does matter. As much as OCP is about you know, freedom of choice, a lot of them have a, a approved vendor list and they want a name brand supplier like Adele. Um, and that's what inspired this relationship on both sides of the coin. The customers wanted to see Cumulus plus Dell together and help make that happen. So you're essentially trying to take the, the, the model, the Linux model for servers and apply it to networking, right? Precisely. Okay, so why did it take so long? Because, I mean, you've got the, the major networking company has a you know, two-thirds market share, you know, dominant position. It's hard to even find another market where there's an entrenched player that, I mean, you look at the server business, it's pretty fragmented. The storage business is fragmented. Uh, uh, Cisco dominates the networking business. Why did it take so long for that open source you know, ethos to come into networking? Well, I think it's been an, an evolution in a while coming right now. We've, we're, at, <coughs> excuse me, we're at a point where the, the hardware ecosystem around silicon is, you basically, it becomes industry standard. So a company like Broadcom has the de facto chipset that people use for most of the networking components. Even Cisco with the, the NCMA Nexus 9000 mm -hmm. launch is also based on Broadcom Trident 2, just like everybody else is. Um, you know, Cisco makes a lot of revenue off of other platforms based on, on tri uh, Broadcom platforms. And customers are starting to recognize that. They're starting to take the tops off of these platforms and look inside and say, hey, wait a minute, that's the same chip in this box and this box and this box. Isn't this all kind of the same hardware? Well, wait a minute, you just said this, <laughs> you said this differentiation, right? But, no, but that's I mean, an example of of Less differentiation, right? Right, so exactly. You got to differentiate differently. <laughs> I guess. E exactly. Yeah. Differentiation oftentimes is yeah. supply chain, form factors, those sorts of things. But customers want to understand what to expect. Like, you know, if I came around and said, hey, here's my new networking chip, it's the best thing in the whole world, nobody knows what it is, how it works, it's a big mystery. You can't build a system around mysteries. You have to build a system around things that you know and understand. Right. Right? Now, the fact that you took a, a chip that's industry standard, like an x86 or a Broadcom you know, networking chip, and stick it in a form factor that's suited to your needs, like the, you know, the open rack form factor for OCP, that's, that's a different discussion, right? Mm. Right. So, JR, I want to ask you about the headline. Wall Street Journal wrote a nice article for you guys. Uh, Dell embraces bare metal networking. So, obviously, <laughs> Bare metal's back, or you know, <laughs> <laughs> bare back is metal. We're back. <laughs> bare metal is back again uh, for the tenth time. No, but that's a real fundamental, you know, nuance, right? Bare metal has been the preferred approach for many people building out data centers, stack and rack. Now you got a big data center operating system concept going on. Cloud, obviously, software defined, kind of everything from right. data center to Internet of Things. Still, there's a software layer involved, right? Network virtualization can help that. But a lot of people forget about the actual bare metal. There's still bare metal involved. There's still data centers. So what, is, what do you mean by that? What does bare metal networking mean? Is it fully differentiated than cloud? Is it kind of interplays with it? Because um, here, it's OpenStack on top of Open Compute. We saw a great demo from uh, io.com CEO. That's cool. Right. Um, nothing wrong with that. Yeah, I absolutely. love that. I'll take that all day long. But underneath that, what's bare metal networking? Is yeah, it so mutually exclusive, or they work together? They're uh, kind of mutually exclusive. It, it, it kind of take a step back from it, and if you're a consumer, any level in the market, you should be able to go fill out a bill of materials and buy that hardware, and then come in and put your software on top of it. And if you change your mind on the software, you should be able to put different software on top. So, you know, Greg Slushman, you know, when he was talking about this thing, they have a platform that's almost like that, except for their networking component. The networking component is branded, and they're stuck with who, who that supplier is. 
They can't come in. Brandon, and you mean Cisco, Juniper, or whoever? Somebody, yeah, I'm not, yeah. Gonna, I'm not the, liberty to say. The networking it, guys. Right, exactly. It's an incumbent networking provider. And so in the context of, of bare metal networking, it basically says you should expect your networking elements to be the same as you would expect a storage or a compute element where it comes in, it, you can buy the hardware, you can cable it up, you can get it from a whole bunch of different suppliers, depending on the supply chain and form factors of choice. And that's what you want to disrupt. That's you want what to we're disrupt, You want to disrupt, there's no real licensing fees, it's more per port or per box, right? You yeah. want to disrupt those guys, right? That's what you're, that's what you're The networking doing. incumbents, right. The networking incumbents come in and say, hey, I'm going to go in and sell you my box in the rack, and if you, you Mr. Customer, once you've cabled that thing up, you're never taking it out, I own you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, and it's not so much, I mean, part of it is we want to disrupt it, but realistically, customers want that disrupted. They want to be able to say, hey, look, I bought a piece of hardware, I cabled it up, I shouldn't be locked into you know, Cisco because I chose Cisco at that point in time. If I don't like those guys, I want to be able to switch to another provider's software. Share with the folks, what's the sons of Cisco? What does that mean? I've oh. heard, I saw that kicked around the register <laughs> uh, blog. What does that mean? What's uh, Sons of Cisco? That, that, that's Jack. Jack has the, the most awesome uh, taglines ever, right? Um, so you know, I, you know, I was you know, part of the Cisco crew for a while. I worked there about 16 years, and it's kind of, I would say, part of the problem, and now I'm becoming part of the solution. <laughs> <laughs> well, so yeah. I want You're disrupting the guy that you know all where the traps are, all those barbed yeah, wire, I mean, trip fair, wires, fair enough. landmines. I mean, when, when I started, it, you know, I was there for 16 years, and when I started, we would, we manufactured everything in-house, in we wrote the operating system from scratch, we did all the ASICs from scratch. It was, it was really, really hard. And technology has matured over those 16 years to the point where we, you know, we talked about yeah. industry standard silicon, we have operating systems like Linux that are very you know, full featured on their networking functionality. We have uh, supply chain, you know, manufacturing people that can build the, the box and ship it anywhere in the world. And so a lot of the, the systems engineering pieces that, you know, that we started off with at Cisco have disappeared. And this is like the new Cisco. This is what it's going to become. Well, 12 years ago, you had to do it yourself, and it helped Cisco's ascendancy. But so given your perspective, and you're a partner with, with VMware. We had you on the Cube at VMworld. Do you have a uh, perspective, I'm sure you do, I'd like to, to hear it, on uh, NSX versus uh, you know, Cisco's uh, application-centric infrastructure initiative? Right. Um, I think the, the, the easiest way to talk about it is to ignore the, like, the pluses and minuses of either side in terms of their features and functions, but yeah. recognize the, the, the grip that any one of those solutions has on a customer. Um, in the context of, C of VMware plus NSX, and let's just call that vSphere for the sake of, of overall sure. discussion, um, I can build a data center, and I can choose to run vSphere on top of that, and if I don't like VMware, for some reason they make me mad, I can throw that all away and switch to OpenStack. I'm not locked at all. My hardware is my hardware. I can put new software on top. That's software-defined data center, right? Now, VMware NSX, they, you know, they can control a hardware switch, you know, Cumulus Linux, Arista, a bunch of other people can be controlled by uh, VMware NSX, uh, but it's still, it's a software problem. Cisco ACI is a vendor lock-in. You go and you build that data center around Cisco, Nexus, you know, the Nexus 9000 and the ACI architecture, you don't ever change your mind, you're stuck. It's a, it literally is a 15-year lock-in that customers are getting to, ready to walk into. Okay, so you're, you're leaning toward the, uh, the open approach. We're redefining open in this, in this day and age, John, right? Uh, JR, I want to ask you about the DevOps killer environment because what you're basically saying here is, Dave, we're just talking about DevOps guys eat glass and spit out nails. <laughs> They're a unique <laughs> breed, right? And the networking has been a bottleneck. We've asked everyone on the, on, on the cube, from executives, Bethany Mayer at HP, you know, network virtualization is kind of that first step towards changing the game. But in a DevOps environment like a Facebook, for instance, or like George at the uh, IO, right, you mentioned, um, they don't want the standard gear, but that's all they can get right now. So you guys want to disrupt that. That makes total sense to where we're coming from. Um, how do you guys compare in that environment with, say, Arista, which, who's had a good name with, um, with folks do large scale stuff, like the Clouders of the world, the new school guys coming up. Um, are you different than them? Are they not open source? Are they one of those guys on, on that side of the street of uh, name brand? Um, or are they frenemy? <laughs> we're definitely competitive. Okay, so good, good. We're sort of that Enemy. way. You know, um, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to throw too many nails at those guys. You know, I, I like them as, as a group of people. I think they're, you know, they're in the incumbent category in that they sell hardware and software together. So you know, th therein lies one of, one of the main differences. Uh, the counterpoint to that is we both have recognized that uh, having a platform that's 
open for people to orchestrate around in meaningful ways, whether it's leveraging an orchestration tool that exists like a Puppet, a Chef, or a CF Engine, or a monitoring tool like Collect D, Nagios, Graphite, or some homegrown thing that a, de you know, a DevOps type might decide mm -hmm. to pull together out of mixtures of all that stuff. That's what makes modern, realistic operational environments fly. So for the folks out there that might not be in the weeds on the networking, so what you're basically saying, correct me if I'm wrong, you're essentially allowing people to separate hardware and software environments so that they're not dependent upon each other, so that they can mix and match the best solution. Is that yep. what you're saying? That's part of it, and the other part of it is, you know, Cumulus specifically, you know, we're, our product is called Cumulus Linux, we hardware accelerate the Linux kernel, so Linux kernel data structures are intact, so anything that manipulates those things, anything you can do to orchestrate a vSwitch, you can orchestrate you know, Cumulus Linux with. So it makes it a lot easier for people to leverage those environments and tools. Well, I just added that on my list of, of knowledge. Thank you very much and sharing that with everyone there. So it brings my next question, which Dave and I are interested in, is when you talk about Linux kernel, you can't help but talk about um, Flash, persistent uh, RAM. Right. Where is that coming in all this? Because that plays interesting, because you start preserving the Linux kernel, Linux kernel based stuff, uh, is that going to change the addressability around data, data management? Does that affect anything that you're doing? Push the, are you, push are the are you bottleneck, more, you know, put more pressure on you, right? Does the, that help the you? The storage, the spinning disk no longer the bottleneck? Or well, you know, you become for what we do, we're not forwarding packets in, in software or anything like that. We know these, the Broadcom ships, they do all the, the heavy lifting in terms of capacity. So we, we as, as a company, and we see the industry transitioning this way, we're trying to add, help customers add more capacity in an affordable, easy to deploy way. So if you look at a modern server, modern you know, x86 platform, Intel platform, and you look at tiered flash infrastructure, there's no fundamental reason why customers shouldn't be running 40 gig ethernet to their servers today. And if you talk to a, like a Facebook or any of these guys and ask them, could you use 40 gig? They'll say, yeah, hell yeah, I could use it. And then they're going to say, well, do you use it? They say, hell no, I don't use it. And they say, why? Because it costs too freaking yeah, much, right. right? And so the reason it costs so much is because the supply chain is such that it doesn't allow people to get to where they need to go. Well, so what's next for you guys? Where are you at on your funding? Have you had your B and C rounds? Where are you guys at? Just give us a quick update. <laughs> We're on round G. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, we, <laughs> just, that's a joke. <laughs> we, just, uh, we just recently raised a round. Um, it, you know, we typically don't talk about it from a PR perspective, but we, you know, we've got enough money to last you know, two, three years. Second round, third round? It's a, a B round, B yes. Round. Okay, yeah, got it. Okay. Series B, we have you know, a great set of investors. They, you know, they believe in what we're doing. Um, we've got a lot of customer validation points, so they're, they're obviously out talking to our existing and prospective customers to understand what the, the possible traction looks like. And uh, they've put money on the table to give us, to you know, let us weather any short-term storm that Cisco can throw at us and come out on the backside as the winners. What has been the biggest surprise for you, my final question over, the, over this past year, in terms of adoption out in the, with the clients? Any aha moments for you? Any kind of revelations around uh, where your value proposition is in the product market? Yeah, there, there has been. I, I expected um, a lot of customers to kind of not get it. And, you know, not everybody we talk to becomes a customer immediately, but every single one of them we talk to absolutely gets it. And they say, this is exactly aligned with where I want my, my business and my, my IT department to go. It may take me a while, but this is where I want to go. And you know, we see this happening now. I mean, we, we, went, we launched the company in June and we went GA with our software at the same time. Um, so we're seeing customers now that are calling us back that we talked to in July or August and said, hey, it wasn't the right time. And they're calling us back now and saying, you know what, now's the right time, let's go. What do you think's changed? Uh, their organizations, they, you know, a lot of times uh, they, they look at, at something like this and they say, this makes a ton of sense, I need to think about it for a while, I need to kind of let it settle and set, I need to, you know, a lot of things have to align right and they start looking at where they want to go with their infrastructure. You know, the fact that we have this, you know, the VMware support, for instance, a lot of them are picking VMware NSX as their network virtualization solution, and they say, hey, great, this ties in really well to that. You know, let, let's go this way. I want to try it, you know, on this path. Mm -hmm. You know, and a lot of it's, another part of it is, is just the organization. They realize they, it's, it's not scary for a networking guy. For a networking guy, it's just horribly empowering because now you can spend less time, you know, dicking around with, simple things, you can automate those parts and spend most of your time around architecting your data flows, increasing capacity, dealing with application level problems. Adding value. JR Rivers here, the CEO of Cumulus Networks. Uh, obviously was on theCUBE in VMworld, a lot of great updates since. Big deal with Dell, Open Compute Summit. 
This is the uh, homebrew computer club of what it would look like if it was in today's world, open source at the backbone of it, open environment, great open hardware, uh, great traction in its uh, fifth event, Facebook really anchoring this out. Uh, JR, great traction on your end, again, speaks to that same religion, openness and choice and freedom. Um, which is awesome about, about what's happening here. Great story. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break. This is theCUBE. I'm John with Dave. We'll be right back. Thanks, guys.